Good morning, Bukh Tov. And um, Rosh Hashanah is right around the corner. I figured maybe we have ideas, thoughts, topics, discussions to share about Rosh Hashanah. Um, I'm open to suggestions. It's at 721 now. Yeah. Maybe we should talk about Rosh Hashanah. Wonderful. What should we talk about Rosh Hashanah? Rosh Hashanah. Um, why Tishrei? Um, what is the meaning of Tishrei? Uh, I understand that Nisan is the beginning of the world, so why, so why is it there Rosh Hashanah? You hear the question? If Nisan is the beginning of the new year, when Nisan is which month? What holiday falls on Nisan? Pesach. Pesach. So why are we celebrating Rosh Hashanah now? What happens now? Hayom Harat Olam, today is the birth of the world. I gave a class last year. Do you remember we spoke about Rosh Hashanah? And I told you that you must know that Rosh Hashanah is not a Jewish holiday. Remember this? Remember? I remember the shock. You weren't here yet. I, I feel the shock again here. You feel it again. Yeah, but I remember the shock. Rosh Hashanah is not a Jewish holiday. Yes. You heard exactly what All I said. All right, I'll take the day off. I'll go to the beach. <laughs> <laughs> it's not even the Jewish day of judgment or whatever you'd like to call it. What, what day is that? Don't keep but it's the opening of the gate. It's right. It's the it's the opening of the time leading up to the day of forgiveness. It's an opening of a season. That's true. Yeah. The season starting with Rosh Hashanah, ending with Sukkot. Yeah. What part of Sukkot? What part of Sukkot is a day of judgment? Hashanah yeah, Very good. Hashanah Rabbah, which is the last day of <coughs> Sukkot, which is really the. In the middle of Sukkot for us because we're celebrating Simchat Torah and here you do it for two days. What happens in Rosh Hashanah? Who are we praying for in Rosh Hashanah? The whole world. Very good. As we said last year, Rosh Hashanah is a prayer for the whole world. The whole world doesn't know how to pray for themselves. The whole world doesn't know what they're supposed to be doing in Rosh Hashanah. And therefore we have decided to take it upon ourselves to take care of the whole world. So really when you go to the grocery store, you go to Starbucks and you get your coffee before the class, see that's the plus of having a class here, so you go and get your uh, vanilla frappuccino and come up the stairs or whatever you like, you should go and wish them, have a happy new year, and they're going to think you're crazy. Yeah. <laughs> but truly it's a new year for them. We are taking it upon ourselves the obligation to pray for them, as it says in the Machzor, V'alam Mamlachot, V'alam Medinot, V'alam Melachim, we speak for all the kings and all the nations and all the countries, Rosh Hashanah is a day we take upon ourselves to take care of the world. And perhaps it's a very interesting thing to think about. I was thinking about speaking about it on Shabbat, but I'll share a little preview with you today. Somebody called me up and asked if this is a Jewish community center. And I said, no. It's not. What do you mean? He said, we're not Jewish per se. And you're all going to get up and leave, I know. <laughs> this community is not only for Jews. And that's exactly what it sounded like on the other side of the phone. I said, what do you mean? I said, either I believe, I believe that this wisdom, this Torah that we learn, these ideas that we teach, are relevant to the whole world, or they're not. And if I don't believe they're relevant to the whole world, then in the year 2015, I shouldn't still be studying them. But the Torah that we have, and the teachings that we have, and the wisdom that we have, and the ideas that we have, can change the whole world for the better. And if I really believe that other religions are idol worship, and I believe that they're uh, mistaken, and I believe that they're incorrect, so why is it that I would say, okay, Jews, you can come here, non-Jews, find somewhere else to go. Where are they going to go? To the church across the street? They're going to go where? To, to a mosque? They're going to go find some cults to join? What are they going to do? If we don't provide the world with, with top-notch spiritual guidance, so who's going to do it? That's our job. It is our job. Now, of course, pe- people will say, people will say, you have to take care of yourself first. That, that's why we do have Jews here, right? But what well. a, but how many years, how many years are we going to be so busy trying to help the Jews and not actually be there for other people who also need what we have to offer? 
See, we always tell people, Jews were not a proselytizing kind of religion. And it's a lie. It's a lie. And I'm on record saying this. It's a lie. We lie to people in their faces. What do you mean we're not a proselytizing kind of religion? Have you met Avraham Avinu? What did Avraham Avinu do? He brought people into his tent. There was a hidden agenda here. What happened when they came to his tent? He learned all about the monotheistic God. Very good. He gave them food, which was for, perhaps someone, you know, I was by the stolen Rebbe in, in Israel, my wife's Rebbe. She said, so how many people come to the synagogue on Shabbat? So it depends how much food we serve. That's the, the more food, more people. Someone told me, you want a minyan in the morning? you got to serve breakfast afterwards. And probably they're right. If you have a breakfast here at 9 o'clock, so people will come early because nobody wants you to eat their food. So then, oh, if we're already here early, then we'll pray also. Food is a, is a big motivator for people. I can tell that I've never gone anywhere for the food. I don't get it. I don't understand the model. But somehow when you announce there's a kiddush lunch in the synagogue, those people you never even see on Yom Kippur. Oh, suddenly they're here for the bar mitzvah of a person they never met in their life. Well, that's because on Yom Kippur there's no food. <laughs> <laughs> that was easy. It's just praying all the time, right? <laughs> but the truth is, the truth is that food is a motivator. And we use it a lot. And Avraham Avinu uses it as well. You know, people were in the middle of the desert. And they didn't have where to eat, they didn't have where to drink. You can come and eat here. You can come and drink here. And then when they say, so how much do we owe you? I said, you don't owe me anything. You just have to listen to me. You have to listen to what I have to say <laughs> and say thank you to Hashem. Oh, we don't believe in your God. Well, then you're going to have to pay. And then he worked up some, some crazy bill. And so they decided, okay, we'll pray. That's a nice story. And our rabbis have a tradition. <laughs> our rabbis have a tradition that Avraham Avinu and Sarah, not just this method, but they use similar methods, and the whole world at a certain point believed in Hashem because of Avraham and Sarah. So what does it mean we're not a proselytizing religion? We say it a lot. You'll ask any no, Jew in the world. We don't go out to get them. They come and then we... When and then we get them? And then, and then we, we don't, don't, we don't, we don't kill them. We discourage <laughs> conversion. Okay, Paul, that's right. Do we discourage conversion? We discourage conversion. We say no at least three times, right? Where does that rule come from? Uh, you're going to tell us. The you same... The, the bloodline. You have to follow the bloodline. <laughs> We discourage three times, and they come, we try to push them away. This should have been in last week's class, but that was made up by the same person who said that we don't proselytize. We don't push people away when they come to convert. We don't. We do today. People do it today, but it's not a Jewish tradition. Actually, Kabbalistic works don't use the word conversion about somebody who converts, you know? We don't call a person who converted a convert in Kabbalistic tradition. They're actually called a Baal Teshuvah. One who has returned to where he came from. And if the difference between this is, is profound, that if you didn't fall out of your chair, because I didn't explain it properly. <laughs> a Jew who starts getting connected back to Hashem, now, it's also now, we're referred to by Hashem as a Baal Teshuvah. One who is coming closer, to, to return back to where I came from. A non-Jew is generally called a Ger, a ger is the word for a stranger who's come in. I mean, somebody who hasn't returned, they haven't been here before. But the Kabbalistic works say, no, a convert is not a stranger who's come in. A convert is a Baal Teshuvah. It's somebody who always was meant to be part of our people, and they've just returned to who they should be. And there are deep ideas here. That some Kabbalists suggest that every person in the world who has ever converted to Judaism, their soul was once in Mount Sinai, and they got lost over the generations through Spanish Inquisitions and Crusades and whatever may have happened. And today their souls are coming back. Now, Why would they have to convert if they were originally... Because they're not necessarily Jewish halakhically. For example, if you were to do the math about how many people in the world today are descendants of Jews who were forced to convert to Christianity in the Spanish Inquisition. Enormous. Conservative numbers, conservative, I mean the skeptics among us, I believe the number to be about 30 to 60 million people. Oh my God. Wow. Say 100 million. Wow. The middle ground is what Paulette is saying, about 100 million people. But that's what we don't do. We don't make them convert by force. Okay, good. You're right. We don't run around, hey, listen, convert or we're going to shoot you. It's true, we don't do that because our religion doesn't view being Jewish as something you're supposed to be forced to do. I have a friend who wrote a book called Jewish by Choice, Not Jewish by Birth. And that was a very profound saying. We don't want people to just have to be Jewish. You want to be Jewish. You want to be part of this. Paula, you were going to say something. 
I was going to say, but I wanted I want to write down the name of that book. Oh, choice. Choice. Okay. Um, if someone walked in to five rabbis in San Diego and said, you know, I uh, I'm raised Catholic. My mother was Catholic. My father was Catholic. My grandparents are Catholic. I feel I have a Jewish soul. And I was talking to Paulette, and Paulette said that um, uh, that means I could be a bell to Shuba. Would you think that person is not? Tell the truth. What I think? Okay. What about, I the, what about the other four rabbis? They would. Yeah. So, so there's a tremendous amount of of discouraging here. And even if they got through you, who was willing to sit down and listen to them, okay, now we throw up all the roadblocks for conversion, right? It's not in the law, you can't do this, you can't do that, you, it doesn't fit, it doesn't work, you really want to do this. And then even if they could get through that roadblock, now they decide, this is terrific, but you know, I want to expand my Judaism, I'm going to Israel. <laughs> I'm accepted in Israel. So this is a this is a new idea for this class. Marley, you wrote Torah perspectives. Could be I think we should use wording like fresh perspectives. Fresh perspectives. Because I cannot purport to speak for the entire Torah community because we don't agree on things <laughs> like Pauletta just saying. But, yeah. but through examining our classic Jewish sources, the ideas that I'm presenting here, you will find them all written down. But for some reason, the Jewish world has chosen to act more like a country club that you have to work really hard to get in and be a member of and be a part of. And I'm not saying that it should be just overnight. Somebody could just say, hey, I'm, I want to be Jewish. Yesterday I was a horse. Today I want to be a cow. You, there, you know, there's, things have to happen for that. But definitely the, the idea behind it is that if this is a message that is good for the whole world, then we must be teaching it to the whole world. And it doesn't mean the whole world has to keep Shabbat, because Shabbat, for example, is not a universal message. Shabbat, the Torah makes very clear, is not universal. It's only for Jews. Jews. But not all the mitzvot in the Torah are only for Jews. You see, not wearing linen and wool sewn together, we don't even know the reason for it. In the Torah, it's a chok, we don't understand it. And we know that's only, we don't have to go to the whole world, hey, Macy's, sorry, you gotta stop selling wool and linen combinations. It's not, a, it's not a mitzvah that is relevant to the whole world. We barely know why it's relevant to us. But there are mitzvot. The other half of the Torah, ben adam l'chavimon, how to treat other people, how to speak with other people, how to deal with other people, respecting your parents, how to deal with other people's money, not to steal. But the depth behind all those mitzvot. So half of our Torah is relevant to the whole world, and we're not teaching that to the whole world. It's our mistake. And so here, I'm proud to tell you, we have a number of people who are not Jewish, who are members of our community. And they know that there are certain parts of community life that are not relevant to them. And they're not a part of it. But it's not because they're, they're put out. Because they know, they've had this conversation with me, and I'm sure there are certain things that we do because Hashem says that Jews must do them. And that will not contribute to your spiritual growth. But the rest of the things that we do, these are things that everyone has to know them. These are things that pilots or even, even rabbis, you have to re-educate them. And so, of course, you should be a part of this. And when we come to Rosh Hashanah, we realize the Jewish people have to get out of their little bubble. So what does it mean we don't proselytize? I'll explain to you. We lived under a Christian or Muslim rule. We wanted to come off with as low of a profile as possible. Every time a Jew stuck his head up, it got cut off. Every time you stuck your hand out of the car, it got chopped off. So we said, we're staying close. We will not get involved with your life. We will live in our little ghetto. The idea of Jews lobbying a government to do something is foreign to Jewish culture. Not necessarily to Jewish theology, but to Jewish culture. Imagine if somehow in 18th century Poland, Jews decided they didn't like uh, Prince so-and-so's foreign policy. And so they went outside of his house and started riding with APEC. Imagine how that would go over. You would lead to the pogroms of 1800s in Poland. So we didn't do such things. I'm not convinced that the fact that we are able to do such things today is a good idea. I'm not convinced. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just not convinced. 
But there are certain things that we developed in our exile because we didn't have a choice. We didn't have a choice to speak our mind. We didn't have a choice to do the things that we knew we should be doing. And it was inconceivable for us to be sitting under the Catholic Church's rule in Italy or to do something in, in the deserts in Yemen and say, Hey, you guys, imagine trying to go and convert ISIS to Judaism. Can you imagine? Now, they might find a home with some Jewish groups that we're familiar with, but... but <laughs> No, but what should... It would be a... Cra- you're asking for... It's a suicide wish to go to ISIS and say, Hey, you want to hear about the Torah? You want to study some Gemara? Well, that's what we dealt with when we were in Yemen. In Yemen, we were living with ISIS, my friends. It's not, they're not a new people. Just like some of your grandparents were living with Nazis. We're living with Cossacks. And there you don't have an open forum for discussion about, oh, let's talk about Jewish values. As mentioned in Maimonides, Morin of Vuchim. You know, it doesn't work like that. So we develop certain ideas that, you know, we don't, we don't get involved in the non-Jews lives. We don't speak our mind. We don't teach our Torah. But they're not necessarily Jewish values. They're survival values. They're survival values. Today, I would like to say that Judaism is, is past survival mode. Or we at least have to start moving towards past survival mode. There's a building in Jerusalem that I always walk by with my wife. It's a beautiful yeshiva. They bought an entire block in Jerusalem. A big, a big block. And they built a seven-story building. Gorgeous building on the outside. And you come inside and there's only half a floor. It's one floor. They have a synagogue maybe four times the size of this room. An office. And that's all that's inside of the building. The rest of it is empty. Because I'll tell you how Jewish organizations work. We operate in survival mode. Like, you know, let's try to buy a plot of land. And let's find a donor to build a building. And, okay, we ran out of money halfway through our first floor. We act like we're like little children. You know, nobody builds a building that they don't have money to actually build. Unless you're operating in survival mode. But Jews like to do this. You'll come into a, a, a huge Jewish synagogue, but there's no paint on the walls. Why? Because we're, we have this thing in our exile mode. We're still, we're still in the... Temporary. It, everything's temporary for us. And it's good to be temporary outside of Israel to realize we're going to go. But it's while we're here, eh, we can still do something useful. Temporary doesn't mean it has to be, you know, you're sitting on these chairs. The story behind these chairs is a beautiful story. I don't know if I shared it with you last week. I shared with you a story, but it reminded me that I was talking to you about survival mode and exile. Please, so I don't get sidetracked. We had different chairs that Marlene hated, but we had different chairs. <laughs> she didn't hate them. She was tolerant of them, oh. and uh, <laughs> so they were they were about four inches narrower, which would give us a lot more room in this room, maybe even five inches more narrow. That means you can't sit on them. Really? <laughs> no, it was I'm too advanced right here. I'm pretty small. Comfort. You could just stand near the Hold chair. on. That's the normal. See, these chairs are 20 to 21 inch chairs. Most chairs, I learned all about chairs. They didn't teach me this in yeshiva. Most chairs are between 16 and 17 inches. Like your folding chairs from Costco? 17 inches, something like that. So 21 inches. These are called church chairs. That's what they're in the name. If you would go to a store and ask for church chairs, they'll give you this. Some even come with benches underneath to put your prayer books. Oh, wow. And we got the kind without the benches. Uh, the uh, uh, shelves, you know what I mean? A shelf underneath. So, <laughs> some churches, but you know, hey, this, is, this is our churches with style over here. No wood. If we put pews in here, we would have So I, I found these banquet chairs, 16 inches, beautiful, from Hotel Del Coronado. Okay, Marlene. <laughs> I mean, they were a little old. They were from 1992. They were in pretty good shape. Pre- pretty good shape. On Craigslist? Yeah, everything's on Craigslist. We found a guy who had a truck of a thousand of them. And we made an offer. We made an offer on chairs. We needed 50 chairs. We'll buy 100 chairs. If they're really good, we might buy 200 and put 100 in storage. Well, what do you have? Okay, discussion. We finally got enough money for 100 chairs told the guy we're going to buy a hundred chairs. Now, where would you put a hundred chairs in the States? It's a great question. Uh, but we were going to do it anyways. And we went out all the way to the border of Mexico to see the chairs. Yeah, we we tried it out. We saw the chairs, beautiful chairs. Some of them were broken. Some of them were dirty. So we said, we'll choose the ones we want. Yeah, of course. What's the price? We'll give it to you for $11 a chair. Fine. Wonderful. That was a good price. To buy those chairs new would cost $40 a chair. So we said, we'll buy one, have one of the chairs sitting in my house, and we'll come back the next day with the truck and the money and cash. We'll buy. 
That night, the guy calls me up. I'm changing the price. Oh, really? To what? To fourteen fifty. So that's three and a half dollars more a chair. Say so no, but if we wanted you to buy the whole thousand. You only want. Oh. So what would I do with a thousand chairs? So I'm like, yeah, well, I said go go back to your partner, tell him that we're not willing. Came back. It's fourteen fifty or not? I said I'll buy it. We'll we get some more money. We'll buy it. He tells me, and we needed to buy two hundred chairs. Oh, oh wow! Crazy. Bye bye. And then he said, and yeah. you can't choose the chairs off the truck. Oh my God. Oh. We're gonna choose the chairs you're going to buy. Oh, he'll give you all oh, the great. And then he'll give you all the broken yeah. chairs, and you're just gonna go home with them. Right, next. And so I told him that this was Thursday night before we moved I'm in. Keeping the one chair. I said, yeah. my friend, I'm not. I'm not. Well, I paid for the one chair. I had fifteen dollars, and oh. and I told him, sorry, but. I don't think we're going to be this. You're such a negative person. You have such a negative energy. He was telling me, like, uh, sure. And then we decided we're not doing business anymore. But the problem is we already decided we're going to move in the next day to the shul. We started paying for our lease already. We, we what are we no going to do? We had no chairs. No chairs. So but people wanted Costco folding chairs. And um, this is where I got started on this. I said, no. I'm not part of the beautification committee, but we had a little meeting over here. I said, if you build a place that looks temporary, it will be temporary. Everything will be temporary. People will come in and it will feel like it's it's only for a limited amount of time. You have to give people a feeling of, we're here, we're staying. I and agree then, with you. Thank you. And then I go on, and everyone else did too. It was a, we all agreed yeah, not agreed. To, to stay away from things that are too temporary. So, we just like someone said, hey, why don't we hang a curtain down the middle of the room? Crazy. Yeah, so we said we'll pay more money. We'll build Mikhitsot. Yeah. So I get on Craigslist and twenty minutes before, meaning during my phone call, there was a Pastor Cooper who posted that their church has a going at a business sale and they have a hundred chairs for sale. So I call up, they already sold fifty. Mm. I said, fifty chairs. Now you have to know. I said, What kind of chairs are they? You can come to my storage facility and check them out. We're moving to a new facility. We don't need these chairs. We just bought them. They're brand new. These chairs are from 2014. And they still have the tags underneath if you feel under your chair. If you go online, you could buy such chairs for $150 a chair. Wow. And I'm not embarrassed to tell Someday you Someday you can resell them. And I went over and I, I, I said, <laughs> I said, Pastor Cooper, how many do you have left? I said, 50. I said, that's a great number. I said, how much do they cost? Well... Take them for ten dollars a chair if you'll take them this morning. Okay. I said we're coming with the truck, <laughs> and it worked out that exactly when the other guy said no, these chairs showed up out of nowhere, Perfect. and Bo Hashem, that was like my wife says, it's a kiss from Hashem. You know, like you I'm thinking about you. I, I got something worked out. So Bo Hashem, <laughs> we got them. We we changed it from the the other side to this side. Bo Hashem. <laughs> Now they're called now they're called shul chairs, but that's the story. The story is I can tell you that from all the synagogues in San Diego, we have the most comfortable chairs. You do, and it's really comfortable. <laughs> if, if people, thank you. If people fall asleep in the middle of Yom Kippur, I'm going to know exactly why. It's like it's just the They're very comfortable. They're very comfortable. And I really I love the color. Thank God. So that's what that's what goes into this room. Everything has a story, but you'll hear more stories. God willing. Survival mode. You can't build a community on survival mode. It doesn't last when you build on survival mode. Because was, 200 chairs would be survival mode. Would have been survival mode. Right. But that's why we didn't survive. <laughs> we, in exile, we've developed many concepts that are not ours. And part of this is that Jews are Jews, and non-Jews are non-Jews, and what was I just listening to that story? There used to be these little bedtime stories that Jewish parents tell their kids, oh, this one's a Jew who was walking in the forest and the Poritz attacked him. You know what the Poritz is? He's the non-Jewish governor of the town and he's always an evil man with a big mustache. You should know. Every Poritz looks the same and every Poritz has a pet bear, every one of them. And they're all affiliated with the Cossacks because they're all Cossacks and they grab the poor Jew and they throw him in a pit and then they try to get money for him and if not, they start to kill his wife and his kids and, and then Elijah the prophet shows up and takes him out of the pit and, and the whole world is saved till the next time the poet kidnaps another guy. And the, that's the way the stories work. And I will not deny that there were times in our history where those were the relationships between Jews and non-Jews. That's the, the reality that we lived in. And just this week someone cursed at me through their car window that I'm a dirty Jew. 
but but it happens to me almost every Shabbat. Almost every Shabbat. Sure. Welcome to San Diego, everybody. In, in university? In university, on Governor Drive. Always on Governor or on Genesee. One of the two streets. It happened once to me around uh, Adat. Oh, okay. Baruch we, Hashem. We don't, we don't need to fool ourselves that everybody loves the Jewish people. We don't need to fool ourselves. But our situation is so much better today. And the world is so much more open. And there are things that happen that are... are and there are incredible things that are going on in the world. And we have an opportunity. The opportunity is to do what we were always meant to do. There's an argument between Rabbi Yehuda Halevi, the author of the Kuzari, and Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, the author of the Zohar. And they argue about if all the world, all the nations of the world were a different body part, which body part would the Jewish people be? The Kuzari says we're the heart of the world. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai says we're the mind of the world. And as you know, in Kabbalistic literature, generally the word mochin, mind, it has a lot of depth to it. But it's an argument. Let's say we're either a heart or we're a mind. What is special about both of those organs? There's one of each, so they're unique. Yeah, and we cannot survive without you them. You cannot survive without them. That sounds like a pretty elitist Jewish attitude. They what else? Other organs. They control other organs. The mind is... Okay. Well, tell me, tell me what else? What else? Not they don't just control other organs. What else do they do for other organs? They feed them. They give life to other organs. Both the heart. If the heart would stop pumping blood, God forbid, the person's body would fall apart. If the mind stopped being able to work, people they it's a coma. The people are laying still and they cannot move even their smallest finger. They also give life, they nurture, they nourish other parts of the body. What else is unique about a heart and a mind? A brain. It's made up of a lot of parts. Okay, made up of a lot of parts. It's true, Am Yisrael is, is considered yeah, many just, individuals that make up a whole. But not the brain. Whole sections of the brain we know nothing about. Okay, this is the struggle of my job, is I don't understand Jewish people, right? <laughs> I said I would love the rabbi job if my clientele wasn't Jewish. Um, <laughs> such kvetchers, and all day long, everything is wrong, everything is this, everything is... Okay. It's all good. It's all, of course, it's all for the best. I'm sitting here all day long. Tell me, tell me one more thing. Can the heart or the brain survive outside of the body? No. Can it survive on its own? No. If you poke it, what happens to it? Bursts. Damaged, very, very severely damaged. When we say the Jewish people are, yes, it's true, we're unique, we're unique. There's only one of us. We are made up of many parts that are in create one whole. We do control other parts of the body in, in the sense that we give them life. If we weren't going to nurture the world, the world would fall apart, according to Jewish belief. But, but, there's a other side to this coin. We cannot... Tell me. We cannot exist without every other nation in this world. We can't. We could not exist without the lungs. We couldn't exist without the arms. We couldn't exist without the liver. We couldn't exist without every other part of the body. And even if we did exist on our own, we would have no purpose. If we, be chosen. I mean, if there were no eyes for which the mind could tell you, look out of them, or no mouth through which it could be controlled. So what purpose would there be for a mind? What, is, what good is a mind in a jar? What good is a heart in a, in a box? And we, for so many years of our Jewish life, we focused on, we are unique, we are nurturing the world, we are resp- but we've never thought about for a moment we're responsible for the world. Responsible is a big word. We have a responsibility to take care of the people in this world on a spiritual level. And we have also the need to understand that we are not alone in this world. That though the heart and the mind are always safely guarded in separate ways, they're separate from the rest of the body, they are never disconnected from the rest of the body. Because if we were to be disconnected from the rest of the world, we have lost our purpose in this world. How do we, I mean, uh, how do we actually act as a light unto the nation? As, I mean, I know we're supposed to be that. But how do we really do 
by, like what I'm telling you, there are many ways, many ways to act. Setting a personal example, all of you have friends who are not Jewish. And when they respect something that you do or something that you are, not because it's, it's what you do, but it's because of your Jewish values that you do such a thing, you already started being a light unto nations when you do that. The same way when you go to the store and, and someone with a kippah throws a fuss and a, I always, you know, I'm, my wife and I differ on this. Not always, sometimes. I believe that I have to keep an even lower profile than other human beings have to. If I'm going to go return something in the, in the store and they don't want to do it, somebody, you always argue with them. I can't argue. You can't. I'll tell you why I can't argue. Because I look different than everyone else, right, and I'm right. representing and something else, right. and it's not worth the five dollars that I'm going to get back right. to to besmirch the name of Hashem in this world. You know what, Rabbi? It's a small little step each time. I mean, each, each one of the, it's very small, and in the global picture, we don't seem to be doing much. Well, I don't. I don't and agree with you. I don't agree with that either. Fine. Fine. Let me say, share why. Pretty, you know, in the fifties, in, in the fifties, um, American Jews acted just the way you're talking about. They didn't want to make any waves. They were coming out of uh, anti-Semitism in America, World War II. They were moving to the suburbs, right? I mean, all of this was happening. They did not want to make waves. And there were certain things those of us of that age range grew up with, which isn't true. There's no abuse in Jewish families. That's for the Goya. There's no alcoholism in Jewish families. And God forbid, whatever might have happened and on the front page of the New York Times... Thank God it wasn't it Jewish. Never happened to us. That's Thank right. God he wasn't Jewish. That's right. yeah. If you know somebody was implicated in a story, a murder, a business deal, something like that, you would quickly look at the names. Pulaski. Oh, thank God. <laughs> because it's, we were also so, the first people to realize that Barbara Streisand, did you know she's Jewish? Exactly. You know? <laughs> and and yet, look at all the books, the doctors, the um, you know the, the contributions that Jewish people, you look at today, have made to this country, where in 1955, everyone was crouched under, didn't want to be seen. In science, every place else. So I think we are, Marlene, doing each individual what they can by putting it out there. In other words, I was a PhD scientist, and I had a new idea about something. I'd write a paper and hopefully be published somewhere. Some other people who are not Jewish are reading that. That's my light to the world. But even on a, on a bigger level, Paulette's right on an individual level, but on a bigger level, the Kuzari has a big struggle. Is there, is there any good in Christianity and Islam in a, in a religious sense? Meaning, do we even give value to the fact? Is it, is it the same thing as being a pagan who bows down to idols in the middle of the... Is it any better? The Kusali says yes. It's because we, for I'll give an example. The belief in one God. Or the belief in a Messiah, and a Mashiach that will come and change this world for the better. Both of those beliefs were only believed by a small group of Jews living in Israel in the middle of nowhere that had no contact with the world. Today, you have a billion people on this planet who believe in a Messiah. A wrong one, but a Messiah. I mean, we have re-educated the world from its core. and its core, there is going to be a better time than the time you're living in today. We had no chance of doing that as some wandering tribe somewhere. We have influenced the world. And we just have to yeah. do it in a more concentrated effort. Declare, you wanted to ask something or share something? Yeah. It sounds very, uh, how do you say, witness uh, Elitist. Yeah. Bec- saying, you know, that uh, I'm not going to fight for $5 with you because... I need to set an example. And that's exactly why they hate us. I mean, and I don't think that it's because I have to set an example. But not I believe I believe that my everyone in the world is allowed to, to make a ruckus and to throw rocks and to fight and to scream and to yell. But I represent something bigger than just myself. And when I represent something bigger than just myself, it's a positive thing that I can do things in the name of more people than just myself. But it's a negative thing. If I do something, why do we cringe when we see another Jew doing something? It bothers us when you see. Why? Because we feel that we're all part of this bigger picture. That we're. I don't believe it comes from an elitist, like I'm better than you, so I'm not going to argue with you. It's I represent something that's much greater than what I'm kibitzing over right now, than what I'm fighting over right now. That's what I think. I could be wrong. My wife doesn't agree with me. So uh... I, I, I think because people generalize a lot, and they are going to focus on one thing and one little 
per and one person that behaves wrongly, and they're going to say the Jews do that. You Jews. Yes. You the Jews, Jews are yes. rich. Mm -hmm. The Jews are stingy. The right. Jews are this. The Jews mm -hmm. are that. They don't see how the Jews work. They don't see, you know. And so I think because the rabbi represents just for his figure, not only himself. If you go, you represent yourself. He doesn't represent only himself. Well, I don't, I don't know if I agree. Let's say you're wearing a high necklace yeah. or you're wearing a Star of David on your T-shirt. Also, you should. Yeah. You're, you're now. I'm not saying so. Then get rid of all Jewish external no, 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 symbols no, no, on no, you. No, and, but I'm saying uh, that if they see me with a high, uh, sometimes they may know, or they, you know what you represent, and they see a man dressed like you. They're not going to associate him to any other religion. When I met this pastor, so and so who. Clearly, these are from the people who uh, were surprised that we didn't have horns. Were that those kind of Christians, not like your um, average American with it. It was a very interesting group of people, but they were so impressed with it. We were there for a few hours, unloading, loading. So impressed with the conversations that we had. And the, I cannot help but think, I will not. I, Yoni Halevi will not turn back the tide of anti-Semitism in the world. But what he may have done is is shown someone. We are very good, decent, honest people, and and that's something that I have a responsibility to do. Absolutely. And it doesn't come from a place of I'm better. It's, it comes from a place of I really believe in what we are. And if I really believe in what we are, then there are certain things in my life that are bigger than myself that are that I have to give into. And this is what Rosh Hashanah is all about. Rosh Hashanah for us is we must take responsibility for the whole world. We dip apples in honey. We do all kinds of things, but. There are so many problems in the world that we are able to, to change. We're able to influence. We're able to, you know, Paul had brought up uh, things that we pretend never happened in the Jewish community. In the last few years, sexual abuse in the Jewish community has been coming out in, in uh, almost similar to what we were seeing with the Catholic priests not so long ago. Although not always by rabbis, sometimes inside a family, just like it is in any other place in the world. And things that we have been denying and we have been pretending never happened and there are groups that still pretend it never happens I very much believe that the eyes of not just our community but the eyes of the world are looking at us how do you deal with the situation what do the Jews do when something happens and I don't believe that we've given, given a good answer of what do Jews do when these things happen and when I know that there's alcohol abuse that is rampant in the Jewish community especially in very religious circles where they're drinking all the time this was a rabbi. What kind of rabbi are you that you don't drink vodka? So why would I drink vodka? Because you're a rabbi. Did I remind you that my grandparents came from a Muslim country where alcohol was illegal? So it cannot be that alcohol is part of our religion. But there are certain people they're used to. It's going to come simchat Torah time. They're used to seeing their rabbi drunk on the floor, right? It's just a normal thing they see. That rabbi is an alcoholic and he needs help. And when I hear stories about people who've been dry and alcoholics anonymous for twenty years. And they come to a synagogue and someone forces them, that kid is, come have a shot of, uh, of uh, whiskey. Why in the name of our religion would he do such a thing? There are certain issues that we must fix and we must take care of. Why should it be only Jews? Why shouldn't it be? The whole world. No, the whole world. That's, it is the whole world, friend, yeah. but we, I believe that we have something unique to contribute in the world of helping, of changing. And that's what Rosh Hashanah is about. Rosh Hashanah, Truly, and, and you're right in saying that if you would go to five other rabbis and ask, is this true? They might not know what I'm talking about. But Rosh Hashanah is the day that was given to us by Hashem. And our rabbis programmed it into the text of our prayers. That we are responsible for the entire world. And we must take that responsibility very seriously. Very seriously. We have a chance. We have a chance to, to give over. If I tell somebody, sorry, you can't come here. This is only for Jews. I am enabling them and I'm forcing them to go somewhere else where the message that they're going to get spiritually is damaging. I believe, and I'm sorry to say this on record, I believe that the message of Christianity is damaging, not because it's a different path than mine. I believe that the idea of someone being born and needing to be saved, that idea which is common to all Christian groups, you need to be saved from eternal damnation. I believe that that concept is so damaging to a person's self-esteem 
It's a person's willpower. It's a person waking up in the morning and believing that they can change the world. If you need a dead person to save you, then your life is in big trouble. Depression. I would be so depressed if I knew that I was taught that I am nothing and I'm worthless and I just need to be pulled out of the pits of hell. What kind of religion is that? Now, is it a juvenile critique on a very old religion? Of course. But I'm telling you that I believe that if we turn people away and we don't provide books, we don't provide classes, we don't provide literature, we don't provide an experience that is also good for the universal community, we're doing ourselves a disservice. We're taking away from our heart and our mind its purpose. We are the mind, we are the heart, and that's what Hashem is about, being part of that purpose. So how do you do it, Merlin? Like I just said, it's personal examples in your own life, the way you live, the way you speak, the way you talk, the way you, you do things, the way you deal with things. My rabbi told me that he struggles with his generation very much. It's the first generation where he's seen rabbis who don't fear heaven. Which is an interesting thing. Someone yesterday told me, well, what if the rabbi is not a Torah scholar? That's what the question someone asked me yesterday. I said, what planet do you come from that the rabbi wouldn't be a Torah scholar? But today you can get your rabbinical ordination online. You could just press a few buttons and read a few articles and they'll send you a certificate in the mail. So you have, yeah, sure, you have rabbis that are not worth the ground that they walk on. They're rabbis, of course they are. But we've, we've lost the integrity of that title. And he said it's the first generation where he's seen Jews put more value on details than on being a mensch, than on being a good person. And this is a very interesting thing to me. I don't think that he believes that all the generations before us were perfect. But there was a, a belief in the Jewish community that if you are, if you are a good-for-nothing person and you're a bad person and you're a rotten person, then just don't associate yourself with our community. But today it's become, you have guys that were now, they had in New York, these ten brothers. Seven were brothers and the three were also brothers. That got convicted of the biggest like insurance scam that ever happened in the New York State area. All with big kippahs and beards. And, and you have people that are praying for them, they should come out of prison. And I'm, I'm asking myself a question. Where are we that these Jews stole millions of dollars from people? And I'm supposed to pray for him to come out of prison? Where is my sense of being a mensch, of justice, of, of what's tzedek, of what is straight, of what is, uh, what is, what is, I, it doesn't make sense to me. But because it's the first generation where we don't care about being a mensch. So the myth is that we're better than other people. But we're not. We're not. We're exactly. Not. That's... We're not. People in, the, in our DNA, we're, in our DNA, we are not. We're, look at the same DNA, my friends. Yeah, look, at exactly. a, look at it in the mic, so we're not. The only thing that really separates us is that we have a moral code so, and rules and laws that we abide by and strive for. Uh, our rabbis say the opposite of what you just said. Really? No, no. It, it, is, it is what you're saying. It's the other side of the oh. coin of what, what you're saying. Our rabbis do say that we have, through our traditions, a moral code that we've passed down from parents to children, from rabbis to students, that has changed the way we do things and the way we act. But our rabbis say that a Jew who strays from that moral code will end up being worse than anybody else in the world. What the Chavetz Chaim says that a Jew who strays from this tradition of, of, of what we've passed down will end up being worse than anybody else because we... We're expected to be in such a place that if we're not there, we're going to do the exact opposite. And actually, I believe the Jews are capable of terrible things. Not just bad things, terrible things. If we, take, if we go away from what it is that we are supposed to be doing. It's, we're not. And people have this, and that's an elitist attitude. Me to say that I'm Jewish, I'm born with a certain... You're not born with a certain anything. You're born... Uh, may I share with you, and it's not meant to sound offensive. In the morning blessings, we say, Shalah Sani Goy. Hashem, you didn't create me a non Jew. So someone once went to Rav Shach. Rav Shach was a big Lithuanian rabbi in Bnei Brak. He said, Rav Shach, why am I making a blessing that you did not create me a non Jew? Why focus on the negative? Why not say, Hashem, thank you, Shasani Yehudi, for creating me Jewish? And Rav Shach said, because there's no such thing. You were not born Jewish. Jewish is a level you have to work very hard to reach. You were created not a non-Jew. Yes. 
But you don't have the right to be born and consider yourself Jewish. You have to work hard to be Jewish. You have to work hard to deserve this title, this integrity that comes along with being Jewish. And when I heard this, it transformed my meaning of what it means to be Jewish. Not everyone deserves being Jewish. And people have to know. They have to know you weren't born special. You weren't born chosen. If you choose to do what chosen people do, you're chosen. Just like if a non-Jew chooses to do what chosen people do, he can become Jewish. But all of us have to go through some conversion process in our life. Some of us have to work harder because we don't have parents that do that, or we don't have grandpa, or we don't have a community because we weren't Jewish. That's fine. That's why it takes more work. But the idea is that everyone has to work hard to be what it is that needs to be a, a, a Jew, to be a Yehudi. And that's Rosh Hashanah in a nutshell. Nothing heavy, nothing big, you know, just simple stuff. Dip an apple in honey, make a blessing loud and clear, you know. The simple things that Jews do. We have to really take care of the world. And by taking care of the world, it means, well, what is our message? What are we passing on to the world? What are the ideas that we're going to bring to the world? Fairness. I, I, think, I think that's a really key thing, fairness. And if you look, it's interesting, at least in this country, at a lot of the lawyers, Jewish lawyers, who've made names for themselves, you know, they're always on the right of the side of fairness. They're trying to get a fair trial for somebody. Something with fairness. They may not be practicing, you know, uh, religious Jews, but they're Jewish, and they've taken what they've learned somehow and brought it into the world. In this last week, I had the honor of meeting people who are exactly what it means religious, but not spiritual. What do I mean by that? There are people who are religious, whatever that means to be religious, and we've spoken about this before, but the external trappings of being religious, doing certain things at certain times, and certain, but so lacking in, in depth, in, in refinement. For me, I'll tell you, if a person's not refined, there's no way in the world that they can claim to be religious. But it's not true. The world, clearly, you have many religious people who are not refined. And if a person is refined, then by their very definition, I consider them to be religious. It could be they've in a different capacity. See, we've chosen Shabbat, kosher, and whatever else makes you religious. But there are 613 commandments in the Torah. So if a person tells me they keep 350 of them, which make them a better person, then how are they not religious? If a person respects their parents and they treat their spouse fairly, and they raise their children, and they take care of their family, and they help the community. What part of that person is not religious? We have to change certain definitions. But it cannot be that you're religious and a vulgar person. Like, it just can't, it doesn't, it doesn't go, yeah, have you met such people? Of course. So I, this last week, had the pleasure to meet such people. And it blew my mind. And never in my life have I had this honor of experiencing such a thing. Not as entitled as vulgar. But, no. The, for sorry. example, like racist Jews, uh, I cannot, my head is not... Opinionated, certain not, opinions that made you cringe. Cringe. I'm, I'm when you heard them speak, <laughs> they, their level of conversation was at a certain level Made me level cringe. That made yeah, it's true, cringe. it's true. That but, was... But, but it's the same, same. Not, not to compare, <laughs> and not to, not to compare, obviously, okay? But if we know of a religious person that is abusing their children or is uh, or their wife or is a uh, alcoholic or is an alcoholic but you know doing something wrong is not necessarily religious very good. I, I told you maybe this last week. I don't remember if I said it. I said it to somebody this last week. They once asked the Tells of Rosh Hashiva. He was the Rosh Hashiva of the Yeshiva of Tells. What do you think about those religious Jews who throw rocks at people on Shabbat? Somewhere in Jerusalem. He said, the same thing I think about the religious Jews who eat on Yom Kippur. So what do you mean? Religious Jews don't eat on Yom Kippur. He said, right. Religious Jews also don't throw rocks at people. <laughs> the idea is that, well, we have to change our definitions. But part of changing our definitions is, as a community, doing change. We, we have to appreciate certain things. When we appreciate certain things, it will create certain kind of people. Yeah. But also, uh, you know, go ahead. Like, there are very spiritual people. That do not practice, does not practice certain 
practices, I'm sorry, of observance. Okay, like for example, they don't keep Shabbat or they don't, but they may they may be very spiritual. Like you said, they may be very mensch, but in their practice, they don't practice everything. I'm not saying they're more religious than the others, but it's just a different type. Are there people who are Shabbat observers who struggle with respecting their parents? Yes. Yeah. Do we allow that to exist? As long as I'm not somebody who's them. abusive to their parents. Somebody who severely struggles with respecting their parents. Or do they do they have a right to exist in our community? Yeah. So what about the person who does the opposite? The deeply spiritual people who are struggling severely with the keeping of Shabbat. It's part of our. It's not an all or nothing package. But you should know. You should know that in. And it's our job also to change this. It's part of our mission here. There seems to be a very big disconnect between spirituality and observance. And the reason is because our observance comes off as very not spiritual. And our spirituality comes off as very not practical. I'll tell you, spirituality is not a Jewish word. I only use the word spirituality in English. I never use the word ruchaniyut in Hebrew. It's not a Jewish term. The reason, the very definition of, of Judaism is not striving to be spiritual. Consider me crazy by telling you this. I think I've already passed the crazy mark today. <laughs> Hashem doesn't tell us, be ruchanim, be spiritual. There's, it doesn't say that anywhere in the Torah. What does Hashem tell us? Kedoshim to you, be kadosh, kedoshim. You're going to translate it as holy. Ki kadosh ani. Because I am Kadosh. Hashem says, I don't need you to be spiritual. I need you to be Kadosh. Kadosh, what is the definition of Kadosh? It's not holy. It is holy, but not spelled the way you spell it. Sanctified. Right, sanctified. It's like the word tabernacle. I wouldn't know what it meant if King James didn't tell me. Holy, I think holy. It's like, yeah, I need you to be in a certain energy space in a way. That sounds too new age, but a certain. It is new age, but it's okay. To attach, attach to some presence, to something. If I would spell holy differently than you spell it. W H. W H. Yeah, need you to be whole. To be shalom. Whole. Whole. Hashem's name is. Shalom. Shalom, right? That's why you can't say the word shalom in a bathroom. You know that? Because Hashem's name is shalom. Peace, hello, goodbye. Shalom also means shlemut, completion, like Yerushalayim, the city of shalem, of wholeness. Wholeness, we use the word kadosh by very few things. Give me an example. Where do you find the word kadosh? Or, or variations of it? Kiddush. Kiddush. What is kiddush? What is, well, let's start somewhere else. Because kiddush is more complicated. But it's good. That's the second thing. The, kiddushin. What is kiddushin? Marriage. I just did a Kiddushin on Monday. What is Kiddushin? See, in a spiritual world, a husband and a wife marrying each other is not a spiritual act. Christianity, for example, teaches that abstinence is a spiritual act. That celibacy is a spiritual act. They're right. It's a very spiritual thing to be abstinent. We're not striving to be abstinent. We're striving to be holy, with a W. To be Kadosh. And therefore, when a husband and a wife join together, what they do is not sinful. It is not an act of passion or pleasure or lust. It is an action of the most holy thing you can do. So much so that there are books of Kabbalah written on what husbands and wives should be thinking when they're intimate together. That might sound crazy to you. But this is a very deep part of our faith. Two opposites joining together to be one. Uniting opposites is what holiness is about. Because holiness means not choosing one extreme, but uniting two extremes. What else? You said Kiddush? Kiddush. Have you ever explained to somebody not Jewish what we do on Shabbat? The holiest day of our week. What do we do? We drink wine and eat bread. We drink wine. We eat, we eat a lot. Not just a little bit. We eat a lot. We light the candles. We light candles. We read from the Torah. Read from the Torah. So basically our, our, our schedule is as follows. We go to synagogue Friday night, we pray a little bit, 
we come back home and we eat. Not just eat, we eat till we fall asleep, basically. We eat and we eat, and there's first courses and second courses and the third course. Then we go to sleep. And we sleep. You don't fast, you don't, you don't uh, stay awake studying, you sleep. Friday night, even a husband and wife are supposed to be with each other. So it's even not just sleeping. Then in the morning you wake up, and you go pray again. And then you eat at the synagogue. And then you come home, and you eat again. And then you go back and you pray Mincha. You can take a nap. You pray Mincha. Oh, you take a nap for about after, right? And then you come back to the synagogue. You pray again for half an hour. And then you eat again. And then you go back home. And you do Havdalah, which is also in Halachic literature. No word of Havdalah. It's called Kiddush again on Saturday night. Kiddush. And then you eat. You have to eat a fourth meal. You must eat after Shabbat ends. Yeah, but how much you eat and what's on the table is where you could be creative. That's true. I agree with Paula. You don't have to eat everything on the table. But you, you eat again. You can stuff out there. And I was once, I was once a mashgiach at a hotel that was a Shabbat program. And one of the waiters came and said, Rabbi, how much do you guys eat? It is incredible. And the truth is that we eat a little bit too much on Shabbat. I'm, I'm all for cutting down on the eating. But, but... It doesn't sound like such a spiritual day. It doesn't. It sounds like a very... Yom Kippur sounds like a spiritual day. Like you fast, you dress in white, you don't speak Lashon Hara about people, you know, you sit in the synagogue all day, the rabbi speaks for too long, you pledge all your money to holy things, right? Then that's a very spiritual day. If you explain that to somebody who wasn't Jewish, oh, that makes sense. That's what you should do every Shabbat. But if you would tell a Jew, hey, you want Yom Kippur every Shabbat? They would throw you out of the window. We do Shabbat every week. Why is Kiddush? Why is that holy? Tell me. You're elevating the spiritual level. Rabbi Nachman of says, The absurdity of celebrating Shabbat, holiness, through eating, is it's an absurd thought. We do it all the time. But that is the definition of Kiddusha, of holiness. It slows you down from your ability. It's, it slows down your ne- your metabolism at a time when you're trying to elevate yourself. Well, it, it, you, food is a, you is a roadblock to, to spirituality. Well, exactly. if you know, when you eat, you get tired. That's you get right. wine. Why are you saying the That's holiest right. prayer of the week on a glass of wine? Wine is an intoxicating beverage. Wine is something you drink. Wine is not a holy beverage. But that's exactly why you do Kiddush on wine. The Kabbalists take it one step further. Your Torah, the Word of God, the holiest of holy. We don't write it down on silver or gold. What do we write it down on? What, what is parchment? Of a dead animal. Why are you writing the holiest Word of God on a dead animal? Because that's that's the only thing to, they had to write on back then. It was alive, so, uh, they weren't doing cuneiform anymore. <laughs> Why couldn't we engrave it on stone? Why not in silver or gold? How would you, how you ever would heard you? the Mormons, they found the tablets, the golden tablets? Why don't we have such a story? Why is the Torah first given to us on rocks, and then we're going to transcribe it over to dead cows, and we're going to point at it, and we're going to kiss it? And in Jewish literature, dead animals are the most... Tame, they're the most impure things that exist. If you touch a dead animal's carcass, you can't even go to the temple. You couldn't even, you would have to go to the mikvah. So why is the holiest word of Hashem written on a dead cow? It's a kosher animal. Okay. And it'd be harder it's, to it's still an impure kosher animal. Maybe because you bring down Hashem's word into the, into the earth, into, into, into everyday life. That, that's the whole idea. Of so the Kabbalists suggest that what you're saying, but differently. Holiness is the goal. To combine, to combine things which are seemingly opposite with each other. And to create not a spiritual experience, and not a physical experience, but to create a holy experience, a kedusha experience. Kiddushin, kiddush, kadosh, all these words are words that, that is our goal. Our goal is to become holy. Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu goes up onto the mountain. And Moshe Rabbeinu wants to stay up there. He loved it up there. It was great for him. Everything is holy, there are angels, there's Torah, there's God. And what does Hashem tell him? Lech red, go back down. Ki shichet amecha, because your nation is acting up. You can't stay up here. I didn't put you in this world for you to leave this world. 
I'm going to stretch my, my boundaries a little bit more. There is something called Christian mysticism. I like teaching here because it's our place. I haven't said these things since I was in Jerusalem. Yeah. My last three years, I've been like living in a box. So now we broke the box, we can go places. Christian mysticism. It's an interesting thing. It's fascinating. Christians don't know about it. But in the medieval ages, there were Christian theologians. Theologians? Theo- Theologians. Know, Theologians. Theologians. Very good. That spent their lives inventing mysticism on Christian texts. The holiest person in Christian literature is... Don't, it's not who you think it is. It's not the Pope. It's not the Pope. The holiest man in Christian literature. I mean, from the New Testament? From, the, from their, their Kabbalists. From their Kabbalists. No, it's not the issue. It's a man named... We call him... Paul? Jesus? <laughs> Chanoch. You know who Chanoch is? Oh, no. No. We barely even think about him. He's like in the book of Bereshit. We mention him like... Uh, in Bas- who is he? They call him uh, Enoch or Henoch or I don't know what they Enoch. call him. Who, who is this person? He's a great, 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 great grandson of uh, Noah. Okay, yeah, right. What happens? What does he do? The famous uh, thing in his life. Kills Kai. Didn't he? No. Call no that's not him. That's not him. Didn't he go up to heaven? He never really very good. Oh. He didn't die. He went up to heaven and never came back. And Christian mysticism is obsessed with this idea of how do we leave this world, go up to heaven without dying? How do we abstain from this world? How do we separate from woman? How do we separate from food? How do we? It's an obsession of getting rid of that which is physical. The other way around, nuns. If you, uh, you know, uh, there are certain things that for us are holy. A nun for us is not a holy thing. What do you use? But your whole life you spend. Uh, but to them it's holy. To them it's very holy, not just it's very a holy. Way of thinking. Way of thinking. Abstaining. Abstaining is what makes you spiritual, and they're right. Our Kabbalists have one person who's the most spiritual person in the world. I just told you who he was. Moshe Rabbeinu. Hashem tells Moshe Rabbeinu, I didn't put you in this world for you to leave this world. If I wanted you to not deal with food, and to not deal with sexuality, and to not deal with struggles, and to not deal with people, I would have put you already in heaven. That's why I would have created you. I created you here because that's the whole point. The whole point is to write the holiest of things on the least holy of things. The whole point of Kiddush is to say the holiest of words on the least holy of beverages. The whole point of the holiest day of the week is to celebrate it through things which are not normally viewed as spiritual. And if you can unite those two opposites, you've now reached this place of Kedusha, of holiness. Ki Kadosh, because says Hashem, I am also Kadosh. I live both in heaven and on earth. I am both light and darkness. I am both good and evil. Hashem says He can do both. So we have to know how to be both also. And this is something that we don't talk about. Because to tell someone to be spiritual sounds much better than be kadosh. Because holiness sounds like, what was the other word used? Sanctification. We don't even know what it means. But I'm telling you, kadusha is about uniting, uniting opposites. That's what we're all about. And if you actually, one last step, because it's already 12 o'clock. Any, any, uh, New age Kabbalists in this room? No, but I interrupted what you were going to say. That's okay. Any new age Mikubalim? The holiest part of prayer, especially if you're breast love. Anybody ever prayed with breast love Hasidim? Vori? The holiest part of breast love prayer? Come on. When do you see God, says Rabbi Nachman of breast love? When you, in, in your passion of prayer, you begin to clap. Have you ever seen this? If you ever go to a Braslav synagogue, when we're quiet, like in Shuman Esrei, they're going like this. It will drive you crazy. I did it before. This is what they do. Now, everyone's doing it. You're trying to concentrate. What are you doing? Rabbi Nachman of Braslav says when two, two contradicting energies collide with each other, and you hear, what is a clap? A clap does it come from your right hand or your left hand? Where does it come from? Your right hand or your left hand? Where does it come from? Both hands. Very good. Both hands doing what? Coming together. 
Now, if both my hands come together, it doesn't make a sound. Oh, oh. Going against each other? Both my hands going against each other. Against each other. I come out with this sound. Oh, this sound, says Rabbi Nachman of Breslov, is utmunat adonai yabit. That is God. What does that mean? When you see two opposites and you're able to hear the music come out of it, hear the sound, and you realize I don't have to choose between physicality and spirituality. I don't have to choose between this world and the next world. You hear that a lot in Jewish communities. You should focus on the next world. You should focus on... It's not true. If you can hear both of them collide and you hear that sound, that's Hashem. Like one of our Kabbalists say that when you pluck the string on a guitar, on a musical instrument, what happens to the string? Who plays music here? What happens to the string? It vibrates. It vibrates. What is vibration? Sound. The string goes from one extreme to the other extreme. Which extreme is creating the sound? Both. Both extremes. Both extremes, the sound, the music that comes out, is when you realize that both extremes, when you combine them together, you don't choose one, you combine them together to make a sound, to make something kadosh, that is the purpose of this world. And Bezat Hashem, Yom Kippur, the holiest thing that we can do is to unite, to bring things close, to complete, to be kadoshim. So next time someone tells you, be spiritual, tell them, I don't want to be spiritual. I want to be kadosh. I want to be holy. Holy with a W is a whole different experience. Uh, next week, do we have class? No. It's Rosh Hashanah. Yeah, and the next week is Monday. Monday. I mean, two weeks from now, we have Monday class. Okay. okay. So, is that the 14th? Yeah, Monday. Okay, so we'll be meeting, we'll be meeting on the Monday before Yom Kippur. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.